and I'm going to open it up now. Welcome everyone who's just joining us. We are just giving it a moment to allow all the attendees to enter the room. So we're just giving it another probably a few moments. The numbers are increasing. <laughs> So thanks everyone for joining us today. I still I see people are still entering, entering the space. And I'm sure that will continue, but let's uh let's make a start. So welcome everyone to the webinar. Uh, my name is Rosemary Morgan. I'm based at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health um, in, in the United States. Um, I'm just gonna start by sharing my screen. So hopefully you're all here for the right the right webinar on how to create a gender responsive pandemic plan addressing the secondary effects of COVID-19. And we very much appreciate you taking the time to to be with us today. So the web the, the webinar is part of a larger project around understanding and mitigating real time differential gendered effects of the COVID-19 outbreak, which is a comparative study in Bangladesh, Nigeria, Kenya, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Brazil, Canada, the United Kingdom, China and Hong Kong that's supported by both the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation as well as the Canadian Institute for Health Research. So I have included the link to our website there and, and please encourage you to, to see, to visit. You'll see many blogs and lots of resources on gender and COVID-19, um, as well as the tools, such as the tool we're presenting today on a gender pandemic responsive plan. We also have a gender working group that currently has over 600 members worldwide. It's a, it's a Google group. And it's a space to share resources and ideas and look for collaborations. And we meet once a month on uh, the third Wednesday of every month uh, from 9 to 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And if anyone is welcome to join, we also have a number of very active subgroups that are working on specific topics. So please visit our website and send us a message if you'd like to join and you're all not already a member. So this web webinar is also co-hosted today by the Johns Hopkins Center for Women's Health, Sex, and Gender Research, which is an interdisciplinary collaborative research group among the schools of medicine, public health, and nursing at Johns Hopkins University. So you can see some of the, the mission of the center there, which is really to create a forum and build and foster collaborations, provide mentorship, and promote career development all around sex and gender uh, research on women's health, sex and gender based differences. And uh, we would like to thank John, the, the center for, for co hosting the event today. We have three excellent panelists today, um, which I will now take a moment to introduce. So first we have Bruna Schall from the Rene Ratru Research Institute of Fair Group from Fair Cruz in Brazil, and she'll be speaking on the gendered impacts of COVID-19. So Bruna is a postdoc at Fair Cruz, and she has experience with sociological qualitative research and is currently working with gender and vector control in the Brazilian context and is what is also a part of the larger gender and COVID-19 project, which I just mentioned. 
Next, we have Erica Rosser from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, who will be talking about how to create a gender responsive pandemic plan. So Erica is a research associate in the Department of International Health. And for the past decade, she has provided technical and managerial support for research studies, focusing on low and middle income countries. Um, she's also a core member of the, the Gender and COVID-19 project team and has contributed to the development of content, including tools for the website, including the brief that we, we, we are discussing today. And next, we have Laura Turkett from UN Women, who will be talking about UN Women's plan for equal gender equality, social justice, and sustainability in the wake of COVID-19. So Laura is the Deputy Chief of Research and Data at UN Women. And for the past decade, she has worked at UN Women leading major research and data initiatives that inform the organization's advocacy objectives and empower civil society and governments to seek and implement change. So she leads the organization's flagship report, Progress of the World's Women, and is currently working on the Plan for Equal, which she'll be speaking about today. Laura is also a co-funder of the UN Feminist Network. Um, unfortunately, we had another panelist, Isabel Yordi at Queer from the WHO Regional Office, who is a gender and human rights advisor. And unfortunately, Isabel had to send her regrets due to something unexpected coming up this week, which just means that we have more time for audience Q&A, which is also one of, often one of the best parts of webinars. Just some uh, go over some quick housekeeping with you before we begin. So please note that the webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the Gender and COVID-19 website. Um, please do type your questions into the Q&A function. Do ask if you can to please state your name and affiliation ahead of your question um, and your location, as we are keen to hear from people from a variety of locations to enrich our discussion today. Please do try to keep your questions brief so we can get in, in as many as possible. And don't worry about spelling at all. The act of contributing is valued more, much more highly than the art of spelling. And you can contact me uh, di via direct message if you'd like to ask a question but would prefer to remain anonymous. That is completely fine. Also feel free to use the chat box to chat with other attendees, but try to ensure that all questions are asked in the Q&A function. If you put, we'll be moderating and reviewing the chat box but there might be a chance that we missed your question if there's a lot of activity in there. So live closed captioning is available for this webinar um, and you, you turn it on by clicking on, clicking on the closed caption button at the bottom of the screen. You can also turn on you can, the subtitles or the live transcript. So there's two options there. You can email us after the webinar at the email address here with any follow-up questions or points and please do uh, follow us on Twitter and if you are tweeting today during the session, which we do highly encourage, make sure to take us on any tweets about the event so we can help to amplify the message. So as I've mentioned today, we are here talking about how to create a gender responsive pandemic plan. Here is the, the, the brief and the link to the brief if you'd like to see more details. Erica is going to go into a lot more detail about this. We also have a key messages brief that will be up on the website that just covers some of the, it's a one pager, covers some of the key topic issues that we'll be talking about today. And just to put our webinar into context, we're here talking about a gender responsive pandemic plan. You know, what is a gender responsive pandemic plan? Well, it is one which takes into consideration the intersectional needs of women, men, and gender minorities in the planning, data collection, response, and recovery. So within all phases of a pandemic response. And it includes considering and addressing how women, men, and gender minorities experience differential primary short-term and secondary long-term social economic security and health impacts. And today we're specifically focusing on the secondary impacts of the pandemic. So with that, I will close out and hand it over to Bruna. Thank you, Rosemary, for the introduction. Uh, I will share my screen. Um, I'm at the end. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. 
so I'm going to talk about the, the gender impacts of COVID-19. And since I'm from Brazil, I'll be giving examples from my country. There are gender imbalances, imbalances in both pr the primary and secondary effects of pandemics. In response to the immediate cha challenges triggered by the pandemic, governments had to make difficult choices about how best to allocate resources. When decisions are not guided by data and humanitarian and social justice parameters, resources end up being used in ways that directly affect the lives of women and indirectly the entire community. For example, in Brazil, the Minister of Women, Families and Human Rights spent only 53% of the budget in 2020. 97.3% of the budget for women's rights was not spent and no money was spent on actions for LGBTQI people. We argue that the six priority areas required uh, urgent attention. I'm going to talk about each of them, giving examples from Brazil. Women, girls, and LGBTQI people are the most affected by gender-based violence. Although the risk of GB, GBV is higher with social isolation, we should not say that it's the result of social isolation, but of a patriarchal structure that makes women subject to subjective success, successive human rights violation, violations. In March and April of 2020 in Brazil, feminicide calls it, feminicide and calls for the Call center for women in situations of violence increased, where records of rape and bodily injury resulting from domestic violence dropped, which does not mean that a real drop in these occurrences, but a greater difficulty in making complaints in the, during the pandemic. Although worse mental health outcomes are being reported among the whole population since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, some groups are more affected a rapid systematic review showed that being a woman is the second factor most associated with mental health problems behind only being exposed to COVID-19. We did a gender and race analysis of an online survey with public health professionals in Brazil and saw that women, especially black women, report feeling more afraid in the pandemic than men. We suppose that there are a number of reasons for that, for example, disparities in access to personal protective equipment and training. The sexual and reproductive health services for women and girls can be affected in different ways during pandemics. In Brazil, on top of these issues, women and girls are facing prejudice and conservative values that are against contraception and legal abortion. Brazil concentrates the majority of maternal deaths during the pandemic in the world, and the lack of policies to address this issue is absurd. Doctors are recommending that women don't get pregnant during the pandemic crisis, but patients report the cancellation of IUD insertion in public health, health centers, and you, the UN warned that there is a shortage of condoms. Also, only 55% of hospitals that offered legal abortion service, service in Brazil continue to do this during the pandemic. Pandemics place millions of jobs at risk. However, certain groups are more vulnerable to the economic and work-related concerns. In Brazil, Black women are again the, again the most vulnerable. With the exception of health workers, most women in Brazil work in sectors that were not considered essential and therefore were closed during quarantine, such as beauty salons. Also, Black women tend to work in more informal work conditions than white women, such as domestic workers. Therefore, they lack social protection when not working. On top of these issues, women have to deal with the increase of unpaid domestic care and, domestic and care work during pandemics. Our group published a comment in Lancet highlighting the disaster of community health workers in Brazil, which are mostly women. Although they perform an extremely important job in primary care, they are not considered health professionals. Therefore, only around 90% of them have received personal protective equipment and training to control the disease in the beginning of the pandemic. Also, a lot of families are run by single or solo mothers and especially by black women 
They are below the line of poverty in Brazil and women are responsible for caring for the majority of children, many of them combining this care with work. In 2019, the World Health Organization declared the global health, that global health is delivered by women and led by men. In the COVID-19 context, it's no different. As this image shows, women are underrepresented in groups of decision makers. In Brazil, it's the same. Most of the nursing professionals are women, while, for example, in the state of Sao Paulo, the COVID-19 task force had 19 men and only one woman, as the, this image shows. While important, increasing, increased representation is not enough to advance gender equality in global health governance. Changing traditional gender norms, such as men, men's lack of involvement in unpaid care work is also key. Finally, the last topic is education. Although policy responses to COVID-19 pandemic are disrupting education for all students, special attention should be given to girls as highlighted by the co-founder of UNICEF. Girls tend to assume more responsibilities in the household than boys, having less time to learning activities. Also, they usually have less access to technology, which, technologies which are fundamental for virtual learning, and they are at higher risk of not returning to school after pandemics because of sexual exploitation, early and unintended pregnancies, and early forced marriage. In Brazil, we observe an intersection of gender and race. White girls, white girls have more access to gender education than black boys. In relation to access to educational material and doing remote or virtual activities sent by the school, black girls are the most affected and white boys the less affected, as this number shows. To end my presentation, I would like to talk about a visit we did last year to several communities of Quilombolas, which are communities founded in the past by slaves that broke free. The communities we visit are in rural, isolated areas and suffer with the lack of water. Women are important leaderships in these areas, as men have often have to migrate in search for work. We wrote, wrote a book chapter together with these three amazing women you see in the pictures, Sanetti, Nenga, and Sida, and I highlighted here some of their words about the situation during the pandemic. Some women, like Sanetti, had to take a second job in order to be able to pay for the rising cost of having children stay at home with schools, with schools closure. She was not able to receive emergency aid because she already had a job, although her salary was not enough to sustain her family. They have to face the challenges of being a woman in a patriarchal society and of being a Black woman facing institutional racism. And with their voices, I end my presentation. Thank you very much. And thanks for the support of these institutions and networks. Thank you. Thank you, Bruna, uh, for that really interesting presentation and highlighting some really interesting uh, gender and intersectional data from Brazil. So uh, please do uh, pose there any questions that you have to uh, Bruna in the question and answer box, and we'll get, we'll get to them at the Q&A period. And, I'd like now like to hand it over to Erica Rosser. Please go ahead, Erica. Thank you, Rosemary. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. <clears throat> so hello to everyone. One of our goals in creating this brief was to create a tool for policymakers, practitioners, and researchers. My goal today is to show you how to use the brief to create your own gender responsive pandemic plans and to inform pandemic policies and activities. So Rosemary already covered this, but to drive it home, a gender responsive pandemic plan takes into consideration the intersectional needs of women, men, and gender minorities. And this applies to all stages of the process from planning and data collection to response and recovery. The contents of our brief fall under six main sections. I'm going to walk you through how the first five sections, data priority areas, process framework, and partnerships can guide us in our efforts to address secondary effects, whether we're coming to the table before, during, or after the start of a pandemic. 
You can use the framework template at the end of the brief to make sure you're considering steps that you need to take at every stage of a pandemic to demonstrate how to record activities and indicators for each priority area. I'm going to use a single illustrative example throughout the presentation, mental health. And as we review the process of creating a gender responsive pandemic plan, we'll see how to record related activities planned for before, during, and after a pandemic, as well as key indicators for the priority areas. So data is a powerful tool in public health practice and research. It's the basis for developing, implementing, and evaluating an effective gender responsive pandemic plan. It's important to make sure that we collect data in an ethical and safe manner, and that the data we collect, analyze, and disseminate is intersectional and disaggregated by social stratifiers like age, sex, gender, race, et cetera, so that we can identify the differential impacts that a pandemic is having on groups of people. And then once we have that data, once we're able to see how different groups are impacted, and especially if we're able to observe those trends over time, then we can start to imagine appropriate protections and responses. Another point I wanna highlight is that these discussions that we have about data-driven responses aren't just an academic exercise, and they're not even just about equity, as important as that is. Having intersectional disaggregated data is about epidemiology too, and can have real epidemiological consequences in pandemic management. According to a WHO report published in June 2020, 57% of the approximately 3,500 confirmed and probable cases of Ebola during the 10th outbreak in the DRC were women. 29% were children. Knowing that more than 85% of confirmed and probable cases were either women or children is valuable information that public health practitioners can use to determine who to target to control disease transmission in communities. So gender matters and gender disaggregated data matters. It's best to use context specific data to inform pandemic policies and programs. However, we also know that the six priority areas that Bruna highlighted for us have proven problematic and important in past pandemics and during COVID-19. So this section of the brief can serve as a guide of areas that we should pay attention to when looking within a specific context. This section summarizes which vulnerable groups are key to pay attention to for each priority area, what are some of the pathways and underlying factors contributing to making each of these areas an issue during pandemics, and some of the negative consequences that can be expected if these areas are neglected. So this section of the brief can serve as an example of what an intersectional gender analysis might look like for each of the priority areas. To address pandemic preparedness, response and recovery, we've divided the process of creating a gender responsive pandemic plan into three sections, before, during and after a pandemic hits. Now, although the arrows are all pointing to the right, you may find that you have to move back and forth across this continuum of activities, depending on factors like epidemiological evolution of the pandemic or data on the effectiveness of response and recovery efforts. And I also wanna draw your attention to the arrow down at the bottom that stretches across each of the stages, continuous intersectional disaggregated data collection, which should be constant. Okay, so let's talk about pandemic preparedness. Um, some of, sorry, some of the key steps at this stage are making sure that we commit sufficient material and financial resources to respond to needs when they emerge and deciding on specific strategic and operational plans and then drafting policies to clearly outline and communicate set plans. In addition to being able, able to respond more quickly in the event of a pandemic, going through preparedness steps has the added advantage of helping us to avoid the tyranny of the urgent that can take over during a pandemic and helping us to stay focused on activities that while maybe not urgent are still very important 
for pandemic management. What would applying these steps towards pandemic preparedness look like in the context of mental health? Two illustrative examples that relate to this stage of the process are identifying budget lines for mental health support and drafting policies for at-risk groups like essential workers across all sectors. Over the past year, we've all become overly familiar with this next stage, pandemic response. The three key activities here are implementing response efforts, assessing the implementation and effectiveness of activities and programs, and then adapting them based on findings. If we haven't been able to take the steps for preparedness, the inclination when a pandemic starts is often to only prioritize emergency measures. And it can be all too easy to think that launching into data collection is not a high priority. But the best way to respond appropriately is to do a rapid gender analysis to inform strategies for response. If we're sufficiently prepared when a pandemic hits and we're ready to roll out planned programs and activities, then assessment will take the form of monitoring both process and outcomes over the course of implementation. It's also going to be important at this stage to continue to evaluate the current context during the pandemic so that we can adapt priorities or activities in response to the actual situation. Um, I mean, a detailed pandemic plan, it's an incredibly valuable resource, but it should be looked at as a living document to be reviewed and revised if there are changes in global guidance or the data or inputs from representative partners, for example. As we continue to talk about the response stage, I'd like to suggest a simple method for turning each of the recommendations in the brief into specific objectives or activities. So here's a chunk of text from the process section of the brief. As you read, you can pick out activities like undertaking a rapid gender analysis to identify priorities, risks, capacity, and resources, and then add that to a checklist of activities that need to be completed at this stage. The next activity in this section would be using the information from that analysis to inform strategies for response, and so on. You can then input those activities into the framework template in more detail according to priority area. So continuing with the example of mental health activities that you might plan for during a pandemic um, could include increasing availability and accessibility of services or training providers to screen for psychological distress. Um, even if you already have a pandemic plan, creating a checklist and then reviewing your plan with that in hand can help to identify gaps in plans or to adapt plans to make them more gender responsive. The secondary effects of pandemics don't end for everyone once the pandemic is over. During the recovery period, the types of programs and activities that will be appropriate may be different from the ones implemented during the pandemic, or they may be a continuation of the same responses. During this time, it's important to carry out assessments at regular intervals so that policies and activities can be adapted and refined as needed once the data makes the context clearer. And that is especially um, important for vulnerable groups and communities. In addition to continuing to provide services, we should keep in mind that after a pandemic, we have an opportunity to build back better. The gender inequities in our societies are exacerbated during pandemics, but generally they were there before the outbreak started. So after seeing the difficulty that many women have juggling dual care responsibilities or the lack of appropriately sized PPE for women healthcare workers, it's important to build or continue to support structures that take gender equity into account. And finally, we should make sure to do after action reviews to record lessons learned for future planning. 
The activities identified for the recovery period can be added to the framework template and in the context of providing mental health support might include continuing to provide psychosocial support to healthcare workers dealing with post-traumatic stress. And finally, we can also use the framework template to record appropriate indicators for all stages of pandemic management. In the case of mental health support, this could be incidents of mental health symptoms or coverage of treatment interventions for people struggling with substance abuse. On the subject of indicators, I want to highlight two more points. Um, one is that there are a lot of resources that we can turn to to select indicators for measure, and we've included some useful resources in the brief. However, as we work to make our pandemic plans gender responsive, we can also consider expanding the definition of indicators. So for example, in this illustrative indicator for measuring reports of gender-based violence, we included LGBTQI children and adults in the definition. And then earlier in the presentation, we discussed that data should be safely and ethically collected. How we collect data for certain priority areas is something that we want to carefully consider during a pandemic. This same indicator, for example, can be difficult to track with phone surveys during a pandemic because people may be confined to their homes in unsafe environments. In those moments, we can consider proxy indicators like the number of calls to domestic violence hotlines or police reports. Um, we can also consider alternate sources for data collection. For example, the Brazilian government started a campaign against domestic violence during COVID-19 where people can ask for help by showing pharmacy attendants a red X on the palm of their hand. Data generated from these pharmacists, for example, could be used to complement official data on gender-based violence. Partnership. It's an important part of any gender responsive pandemic plan. In the brief, we talk about how pandemic impacts are not limited to the health sector. They require multi-sectoral and multi-level action. This section of the brief can serve as a guide to think through key questions like the ones highlighted here on this slide. Um, gender experts, for example, are key because they can help to build capacity for gender analysis, which isn't widely used. Stakeholder mapping. There are advantages to having started this process before a pandemic hits, but it's a useful and important exercise at any stage, and it can help you to make key decisions like what sectors are impacted by this priority area. So are you looking at the health sector as well as the education or economic sector? What level of partners can I bring in? Each level will have different advantages and limitations. National level partners may have a wider influence and impact, while local level partnerships would probably provide better insight into the realities on the ground, and they may already be conducting activities. And what type of partners can I bring in to support different activities? So as an example of types of partners to consider, Aetna, an insurance provider based in the US, is offering free mental health support to all hospital-based essential employees and their families in the states of New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. To address mental health at a national level, the Ministry of Education in India started a website that offers psychosocial support to students during COVID-19. We hope this brief will serve as a tool to help you outline key activities to implement at every stage of a pandemic and a guide on the importance of using data to inform responses and establishing multi-sectoral and multi-level partnerships. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erica. <clears throat> and now I'd like to hand it over to Laura Turquette. Please go ahead, Laura. 
Hi there. Um, thanks very much. Um, thanks to the organisers um, for inviting me. I've been admiring the, um, the gender and COVID-19 working group uh, work since the onset of the pandemic. So it's a, a real pleasure to be here and also to um, go after two uh, uh, such uh, interesting speakers. So um, I will also share my screen. Um, let me just do this. <clears throat> Okay, so um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the work that um, UN Women's been doing uh, around the impact of the crisis on gender equality, um, the policy response, but then also um, give you a bit of a preview um, on a, a project we're doing um, called Plan for Equal, which aims to lay out a, an agenda for building back better um, after the crisis in ways that promote gender equality, social justice and environmental sustainability. Um, so just in terms of um, the gendered impact of the crisis, I think we've um, already heard quite a bit about this. So I, I, I'll go over this fairly quickly, but um, you know, we know that women are overrepresented among frontline health workers, um, that domestic violence has been spiraling up. Um, the burden of unpaid care has, has increased um, uh, um, and is mostly being shouldered by women. Um, women's uh, work and job losses have been um, proportionately <clears throat> much higher than um, for men. And I think all of this is leading to um, some of the, the, the modeling work that we've done suggests that um, some of the progress that's been made over the last um, couple of decades on uh, reducing extreme poverty um, looks like it's going to be reversed um, in, in one short um, year. Um, and Overall, we've also been looking at um, government responses um, to the pandemic from a gender perspective. We've um, worked with UNDP on a global tracker which looks at um, the policy response from a gender perspective. Um, and um, what we found overall, we looked at um, social protection measures, labor market measures, um, and um, measures to address violence against women. And overall, we found that um, only a very small proportion of the social protection and labor market measures are gender sensitive. Um, and a very tiny 8% of, of the measures that we looked at um, address unpaid care work. Um, overall, 20% um, of countries that we looked at registered no gender sensitive COVID-19 response uh, measures at all. Um, this data here um, is available um, on the, the website address that you see down here. Um, and we're just about to, this data is actually from September, 2020. We're just about to publish a big update um, of this um, policy data. And we'll also be including some really interesting new um, information on women's representation in COVID task forces. Um, Bruna was sharing how underrepresented um, women are in some of the, the, the state level um, task forces in Brazil and, and we'll be um, able to um, add to that information um, for about 150 countries. So I'm going to skip past that. So, um, <clears throat> So what about the longer term impact? Um, and this is where um, uh, UN Women's um, Plan for Equal comes in. Um, it's very clear that the, 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 the impact on the global economy of the COVID-19 crisis are already um, profound um, and the crisis is still very much unfolding. Um, I don't know where I'm sitting in New York, it feels like um, you know, we may be close to the beginning of the end with um, vaccines becoming available, but it's also very clear that while the global North stockpiles vaccines um, uh, you know, that they are like grossly um, unequally distributed globally. And I, I read somewhere that only um, 20,000 vaccines in total have been administered in the entire of Africa. So while the majority of the, the global population doesn't have access, we're all clearly still um, in, in a very dangerous place. Even before COVID, the global economy was in a fragile state, having not really recovered fully from the 2008, 2009 global financial crisis. Um, and was characterized by sluggish growth and growing inequalities, which was also fueled by, you know, growing nationalism, xenophobia, um, backlash against um, women's rights and so on. And while the global fiscal response um, to addressing COVID-19, although not very necessarily very gendered, has been um, quite enormous, uh, close to 12% um, of GDP, um, it's been largely concentrated in, in high income countries. Meanwhile, in the global south, um, country, uh, countries are already being pressured to implement austerity policies, um, which we know have a hugely damaging impact on women. The other kind of piece of context is um, the other crisis that is coming fast um, is already with us in many parts of the world, um, which is the crisis of environmental degradation, 
um, and climate change, which threatens to put the impact of COVID-19 somewhat in the shade. So in many ways, um, we feel that we're at a crossroads. Um, are we gonna double down on the mistakes of the past or are we going to use this crisis as a, as a wake up call to do things differently? And this is the context against which we are working on our plan for equal, which aims to guide policymakers and advocates to influence um, the creation of a more equal and sustainable post COVID world. The plan will bring together um, a visionary agenda, um, but also with a, a concrete uh, a set of concrete steps that will help us get there. And it's been informed by um, a multidisciplinary um, uh, set of insights from feminist economics, from feminist ecology, um, from gender and social policy. Um, and it's been guided by an amazing expert advisory group. And we've been working with um, some leading um, thinkers and activists to, um, to bring the information together. So um, the plan for equal is about creating an economy that centers care for people and planet. And we want to sort of center this, um, this, this question of what is the economy for? We want to kind of propose that the answer of that is that the purpose of the economy is to enable the survival and flourishing of life. Um, and that therefore we need to um, make policy accordingly. And we've identified three um, interlinked um, policy areas, um, which are um, about uh, uh, creating a caring economy, uh, generating sustainable livelihoods, um, and gender just transitions to environmental sustainability. Um, and then there are a couple of uh, sort of, you know, how do we get there points as well. So I'll just um, spend the rest of the time that I have talking a little bit about each of these. So in terms of creating a caring economy, um, this is really about um, placing at the center and adequately supporting um, what many have come to, to now realize is essential, um, which is the care for others. And also ensuring the greater recognition and reward um, for the people that provide that care. Um, we think that rebuilding our economies um, can have invest, investments in care services um, at their center. Um, whether that's um, you know, child and elder care services, healthcare um, and education. Um, to give one example, it's estimated that um, 18 million health jobs are needed to meet the SDGs by 2030. So it's a way of generating employment. And by the way, also these jobs are green jobs. And the second part of this is also, you know, it's not just any old jobs that we want to, to, to create, but, um, but decent jobs and ensuring the um, rewards um, and, the, and the rights of, of paid care workers are, are protected. And I think in this crisis, we've seen how the occupational health and safety of, of care workers and particularly at the bottom of domestic workers, of community health workers and so on have, have been um, so kind of compromised and endangered. In terms of generating um, uh, sustainable livelihoods, um, I think one of the things that we've seen, if, if not very gender responsive, we have seen a big social protection um, uh, response to the crisis. Um, but I think it remains unclear as to whether the temporary measures that we have seen um, can be made more permanent and whether the kind of gaping holes that we've seen in social protection systems um, can be plugged on a more um, sort of permanent basis. So one of the challenges that we want to kind of look at is that the, the issue of the kind of missing middle, which is where mostly informal workers who are not considered poor enough to qualify for narrowly targeted social assistance um, are you know, falling out of the, out of the framework of, of the social protection systems we have. Um, and so attempts have been made to plug these holes, but the question is whether we can extend those measures and, and really um, think incrementally about how we build universal and gender responsive social protection systems that then move um, the, the millions of, of women and men in the informal economy to more formal um, forms of work. The other issue that we want to look at under this um, heading is around um, the, the kind of the broken global food system and, and how that impacts um, on uh, you know, the livelihoods of women on health um, and also on, on the environment. So um, the third area is about gender just transitions to environmental sustainability. Um, and this is an, uh, an issue um, that we've been hearing a lot more about um, uh, lately, the idea um, that um, you know, in order to move um, economies onto more sustainable um, patterns of consumption and production, um, particularly workers' organizations have been calling for a just, a just transition uh, to protect workers' rights. Um, and, and the most common kind of approach to this has been a sort of do no harm in terms of um, those jobs that are, risk, that are at risk, particularly in 
kind of polluting fossil fuels and carbon intensive industries. But what we want to suggest is that we can have a much more expansive view of justice um, and expand that out into a perspective um, of a gender just transition to ensure that gender inequalities um, embedded um, in social and economic life are um, uh, addressed as part of that transition. Um, so in terms of how we get there, um, we have two um, kind of important how-to areas. And the first um, goes back to where we started on the issue of macroeconomic policies and the real urgency to align those policies, you know, thinking again about what is the economy for, aligning those policies with um, the kind of social environmental um, goals that we're interested in achieving. And then the second is about, you know, feminist leadership for progressive policy change. I think in this crisis, we've heard a lot about how having a woman head of state is, um, you know, a, a sort of a ticket to a better um, pandemic response. And of course, we know that it's tempting, but we know that that's too simplistic, really, and that um, feminist change is complex, it's context specific. But what can we learn from um, the kinds of, you know, um, the feminist policies and, and the successes that some feminists have had in civil society, um, in government and in other spaces of, of advancing a feminist agenda during this um, time of crisis? What can we learn from that? Um, for the future. So um, I will stop there, um, but just to let you know that the plan for equal is coming soon. Um, it will be in uh, your inboxes in on a website near you um, in May 2021. Thanks so much. Thanks, Laura. And I really look forward to seeing the plan for equal resource and I'm sure we'll be sharing it broadly with the gender and COVID-19 working group and on Twitter as well and and thanks for sharing um, about the policy tracker i know we found it a very invaluable resource um so we, we do have some questions coming in from the audience i'm going to start with one uh bruna for you that that came from Haley stewart uh she asked is that um is your work also looking at the experiences of lgbti plus people also she was shocked by your point about the ministry having used none of their budget to support this community. Thanks for the question, Haley. Uh, yes, uh, we will look uh, for data about the LGBTI uh, community. Uh, we will start a, a gender policy analysis that include them and hopefully next month we will start uh, doing uh, field work uh, that will include LGBT uh, people. And yeah, it's a shock about the, the ministry not using, but it's not a surprise, unfortunately, because our government is very conservative. The current Brazilian government is very conservative. Thanks, Bruna. And if any other, uh, Laura, or Erica, if you'd like to chip into any uh, questions and Bruna as well for what, when a certain question is asked, please, please do go ahead. Um, I think the net, the, we have a question from Heng Li Tan from Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, and she's based in Malaysia. She's asking, and how do we overcome political barriers to mainstreaming gender in pandemic plans? In other words, how do we advocate for gender related issues to be prioritized? And Erica, I think I'll, I'll hand this one to you first. Thanks, Wengli. Um, I think there's a lot of things that we can do. One of the statistics that Bruna mentioned in her presentation was that although women make up 70% of the health workforce, they are only in 25% of leadership positions. <clears throat> so I think that by they're an important group of stakeholders, and if we're able to diversify the people who are in decision making positions, we can probably expand some of the priorities um, that are being talked about at higher levels. I would also say that um, probably at different levels, uh, there can be different kinds of advocacy. So multinational organizations like the UN um, have an incredible amount of influence in certain situations and that can help to guide priorities. Um, but also civil society groups can be very influential 
uh, even just at the local level, even just in terms of making changes in their communities, they can advocate for the needs of the people living there. And I would also say that I, I certainly hope that the work that we do as academics um, helps to expand the, the range of things that are being prioritized and that we're able to advocate for and speak to some of the issues of marginalized groups in particular. Thanks, Erica. And Laura, there's a, a couple questions coming in for you. I think I'll try to combine a couple of them. One from Haley Stewart is when I think when you were presenting the policy tracker, she asked what countries are doing this well, if any. And then um, sort of a, a question from, from Lila Dos Santos Gomez, um, who from Yarrow Global Consulting in Germany says that she especially appreciated the link between the care economy and pandemic responses. Could you give extra examples of some indicators you see that measure a move from a growth to a care economy? How can we actually measure this transition? Um, so on the which countries are doing well question, um, on our tracker, on the tracker site, um, I can put the, the link again in the, in the chat, we have um, a series of, of fact sheets about the, the tracker data, one for global and then one for each of the regions. Um, and at the end of each of those we have, I mean we have examples throughout, but we, at the end of each of those we have a kind of case study on a country in that region that's sort of doing relatively better. Um, the one that I you know that we we are sort of have, we're kind of talking about quite a bit at the moment is um, is Argentina. Um, they've got a relatively new government, and you know I think the women's movement there have been you know <laughs> really killing it recently with um, you know the reform of um, uh, finally the reform of abortion laws and so on. But I think what um, you know I think what the case of Argentina um, sort of tells us is that this is about sort of decades of of women's organising of feminists. Um, you know, positioning themselves, you know, within civil society and also then in, in um, key parts of the government. Um, and as a result, you know, right from the outset, um, Argentina um, increased, um, uh, you know, cash transfers, uh, the cash transfer program that was specifically targeted at women um, increased the, the amount um, that was given. Um, and they've also um, done quite a bit on, on addressing um, violence against women and so on. So. That's one example, but do have a look at the, the fact sheets for the, the other examples. There are some there are some kind of fairly good examples from every region, I will say. Um, on the indicators of how we move to a more caring economy, I think there's been some really interesting work um, done by um, feminist economists, kind of um, questioning whether you know the idea of GDP is is the measure that we really want to set as a benchmark for, um, for you know, the sort of, um, you know, the flourishing of our, of our um, societies and economies. Um, and I think particularly in the context of um, the environmental crisis that we're, um, you know, that we're experiencing, um, you know, I think that those growth measures are particularly kind of inadequate. Um, so I, I'm not sure, um, uh, I'm not sure that I have a kind of answer for you in terms of what we need to do instead, but I think there are already some interesting um, kind of debates and approaches around that and about, around measurement and and how we how we value um, the things that we um, that we want in, in in society in terms of care and so on. Um, yeah, I think I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Laura. Um, so Bruna, I'm going to pose this next question to you because I know you have experience with this. So this comes from, so, and I really apologize if I get anybody's names pronounced incorrectly, Raja Laskimi. Um, she asks, how, do research how does research during pandemic times go through ethical review boards given the shortage of time and logistic limitations? What are your experiences on this? <laughs> Yes, uh, it's very difficult. Um, we uh, we just had approval from ethics committee and we submitted like uh, I think almost six months ago. Yeah, it's it's it takes a long time and it's it's a, a challenge. Uh, we were able to do online surveys without um, 
ethical committee approval and also policy analysis and data from uh, social media that it's public. But to do qualitative, qualitative studies, we need ethics approval, and it really takes a long time. And yeah, we, we don't have a solution for that. <laughs> I know it's just one of those other things that we have to deal. We have to go work through, isn't it? Yeah. So um, there's been a couple questions around women's leadership, and I think. Um, I'll, each of you, Rose, Rose, um, Rose has, uh, raised this point in your presentations. So um, let me just pull out the couple questions. So Lucy Ferguson asks, how can we move beyond the idea of feminist leadership, meaning women leaders, and the essentializing tendencies of the arguments about women leaders dealing better with the pandemic? What can we do to build a stronger notion of feminist leadership at the global level? Um, and let me... Here's another one from Savita Kolkarni, who asks, is there any evidence to, to suggest that women in decision-making positions have developed more gender responsive pandemic plans, or is it too early to come to any conclusion regarding women leaders demonstrating transformed decision-making? So uh, maybe Laura, we'll go to you. And then Erica, if you see if you have anything that you'd like to add. So, I mean, I think, you know, we've seen a lot in the media about how, you know, women leaders have, have been, you know, responding more effectively to um, the pandemic. I, I see Jennifer Piscopo is on this call, and I think she is one of the ones that has written recently, um, kind of debunking that idea in the sense that it tends to um, be the result of kind of selection bias in that, you know, the countries that have women leaders also tend to be, you know, those that are maybe in a better position to be able to um, respond in terms of, you know, being... Uh, you know, having greater kind of state capacity and, and having stronger states and so on. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's like I say, it's a kind of attempting uh, narrative, but I, I think it, it it sort of in the end, as, as Lucy was kind of hinting at, it perhaps does us a disservice in terms of a more nuanced kind of um, understanding of, of how we can bring about feminist change. And um, I mean, I think I'm, I'm also going to um, cheat a little bit here because um, so in order to come up with our, our plan for equal, we've been um, having a series of um, kind of virtual expert group meetings and we actually, actually have the one uh, which Jennifer is part of um, on feminist politics coming up in a couple of weeks. Um, so I think in that forum, we're gonna have a really interesting conversation about what are the kind of key ingredients for um, you know having a more um, uh, you know having having um, a greater integration of kind of feminist politics within um, kind of mainstream policy making and I mean I think um, yeah I mean I, th I think it's obviously very context specific and all the rest of it but I hopefully we can kind of draw out some of the kind of key uh, the key um, you know some of the key factors that make a difference and I think undoubtedly having a strong women's movement and having feminists you know located within the government within civil society you know in academia all working together from their different locations is is, is going to be quite key. Thanks Laura maybe if, um, if you get a chance put the link to the event in the in the chat box and I'm sure others on the call would be really interested in attending. Sure and Jennifer's just posted her her piece about the the uh, women leaders so you can you can you can read it in a much uh, probably more clear, 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 clear and uh, expert way there great thanks jennifer um as we're nearing the the hour eric i might ask you a different question so there is a couple questions specifically related to the brief and the sort of gender pandemic response plans so rohini pande asks um she says that i really like the framework thanks for sharing it's been available on the gender and COVID-19 website for, for a little while, thanks for that. So I was wondering if you have heard from anyone who has tried to use it and could share their experiences. Another question um, from Aparva Kurma Pandya is, uh, she is from the Indian Institute of Public Health in Ganding Angar. Um, she asks, are there any examples of countries that have prepared and implemented gender responsive approach before the pandemic and implementing the same during the pandemic and beyond. How can a low and middle income country adapt on a gender responsive approach? Thanks, Rosemary. Um, 
So the first thing that actually came to mind was the, as the, you were reading the second question, was um, the UN Gender Tracker, which, um, as you mentioned, is an incredible resource. And I even had a table for my presentation with some examples of gender sensitive measures that um, different countries have taken during COVID-19, but there wasn't enough time to go into it. But I would recommend that you look at that because you will really see just a range of different activities, um, things related to budget. So there are examples of different stimulus plans or tax measures that were implemented for vulnerable groups. And I think that, um, one of the things that is useful to consider when looking at something like the gender tracker is that people may not necessarily intend for their pandemic planning to be gender responsive. Um, they may not define it that way, but they may still be making decisions that are gender sensitive and that are taking different groups into consideration. So that's a very good resource to start with. Thanks, Erica. And we are right on the hour, but just Laura, Bruna, is there anything for that question that you might might like to add? No? Okay. Uh, we are on the hour. We have received many more questions and thank you for that. There's some really interesting questions for like from Myra Betron asked about vaccine rollout, which I think is really important. Amy Margolis asked about social protection and how can we actually kind of modalities for sort of measuring that and response to that. And Ken Chan Lama asked about examples of LGBTQI part participation and partnerships during research. And I'm, I'm sad that we don't have time to get to these really, um, really interesting questions. And then Heather Allen um, asked really important questions about gender and transport, about it having been reduced, has been, you know, and a huge impact on women's ability to bounce back. Um, and these are all very relevant um, and important questions. And I'm, I'm sorry that we don't have time to get to all of them, but would like to, to thank you all for coming today and being part of this webinar. The slides, we will make the slides available um, with permission from the, from the panelists and the recording will also be available online. So thank you everyone for joining us today. And I see Laura has put in some, some the, the links to the gender tracker, so thanks Thanks for that. And yeah, please do visit the Gender and COVID-19 website, join our working group if you're not already a member and there's lots of activities going on in this space that we'd love to, to collaborate with you on. Thank you everybody. Bye. Bye.